Dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You Podcast, where you're going to learn everything you need to know about dating, relationships, sex, and men from a man's point of view. Uh, except today, we're going to bring in another point of view. Uh, and, and it's a point of view that is extremely valuable that I could not possibly offer myself. I believe I met Dr. Patty Britton uh, 10 years ago at a live event in Hollywood run by a friend named Alicia Brandt. It was called Women's Night Out. They'd rent out a, a nightclub and uh, it was all women in the audience and they'd mostly bring women on stage. Uh, it was like a live interactive comedy entertainment show for women. And they had a segment called Ask a Man. And a couple times I was the man that was on stage and uh, I was being asked questions, but I was like the token man. It was all women, all everything. So I don't know if Patty remembers that, but I remember distinctly how impressive she was and how she offered a uniquely valuable service that was, uh, that was way out of my depth as just a dating coach for women. So Dr. Patty Britton is a clinical sexologist, a sexuality educator, and the pioneer of sex coaching with top level credentials. As a well-respected world leader in sexology, she's an academic author, popular speaker, trainer, and workshop leader. She hosts over 40 DVDs for couple sexual enhancement. She's a frequent guest on Summit's national TV shows, documentary, live talk and news radio and magazines such as Cosmo, Men's Health, Women's Health, and Glamour. She has a private practice in Los Angeles and via Skype globally. Dr. Patty is the co-founder of Sex Coach U, the world's premier credentialing and training organization for sex coaching. We're going to learn about how, how to not, not just have better sex, but we're going to learn how to be a sex coach today. So pretty badass stuff. And without further ado, I'll introduce my friend, Patty Britton. Hello, Patty. Hi, thank you so much. What, it's so fun to go back to Women's Night Out with Alicia you're, Brandt. You remember that. that, right? Of course I remember that. And I was, there, every one of us who were like regular experts had a song that was created and I was the love doctor. And I had my own song and I would give fractured sex ed lessons. So it was, it was a lot of fun and I miss it. I miss it terribly. I know. She's, I think she's a psychologist now. That's yeah. What she moved into. She did. She left uh, the world of entertainment to heal others and actually is As one bring, does. You know, she's thinking of bringing it back, so we'll have to have you back too. I hope so. I, I, I can only hope to be involved enough that I can get my own song. You're going to get your own song. I don't think I will. I think, I think <laughs> Women's Night Out means it's really women. I, I, there's, a, there's a world I can't quite penetrate. I'm never going to be the keynote speaker at I don't think you are. <laughs> women's Summit. Yes, yes anyway, but we need you too. <laughs> let's, let's talk, let's talk about, about you and um, the, I mean, I read the official bio, but what's the, the, the 90 second, here's how I became one of the world's leading experts in sex, because that's not, most kids don't wake up one morning and say, hey, I know what I'm going to do for a living. Well, this kid didn't either. You know, um, being somebody who is in the baby boomer generation, actually first wave, and with our own radio show, theboomdoctors.com, where our show resides, we actually, those in my generation, went through an evolution during the sexual revolution. And, and I, I think it does inform who I am because so much of my sex positivity and my activism and my support for empowerment probably comes out of that political generation. And I've had a stellar career. I've been so fortunate in my career to work for some of the leading sexual health organizations in this country and even with international influence, like National Planned Parenthood, which of course right now is under terrible political attack and serves so many important and critical needs in women's sexual health care and the Sexual Information and Education Council of the United States, where I was responsible for delivering sex education guidelines, K through 12. Imagine guidelines from kindergarten through 12th grade in how to be healthy as a sexual being with guidelines for every single one of those grade levels that's age appropriate. That was one of my first jobs when I was working at that organization. Are, those, are those standards still in place? They are. 
They are. This is such an interesting time that we're living in. And I know we're not really here to talk about sexuality education, but as a clinician, I see the results of poor or no sex education. If we're promoting an abstinence only before marriage agenda, we're not teaching our young persons and kids comprehensive sexuality education. They don't know how to make the decisions, how to be responsible, and what sex really is all about in all of its dimensions. So a lot of the work I do, I just left a session to come onto the show, and a lot of the work I do is corrective and giving positive and accurate sexuality-related information along with coaching and the clinical work that I do. But I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm somebody who my whole life has been dedicated with passion to promoting positive messaging about sexuality and who we are as sexual beings and what really we're entitled to and how to overcome what stops us from being fully who we are. Why does this make us so uncomfortable? It's a charged topic, just like death and money. <laughs> Those, you know, the big three, sex, death, and money. And it's so interesting because I've always been that person, that person who people would tell anything to. And when it comes to sexuality, there really aren't a lot of us who are schooled and trained and competent as experts. It's a really small field professionally. I, I'm always stunned to realize that as a past president of ASEC, for example, the national organization that credentials the qualifications for sexuality educators, counselors, and therapists, I see that there is such a lack of training worldwide, which is one of the reasons I do a lot of professional training, and that people are squeamish and scared to talk straight about sex. And it's packaged in different ways in the marketplace by people who claim that they're experts or sex experts, but many of them are really incompetent. And I always have this, this bias that I carry, which is I say to my students and my protégés and people that I train, I say, don't commit the Humpty Dumpty effect. Don't be responsible as that person who opens up another human being like Humpty Dumpty. They fall apart and you don't have the wherewithal to help them put themselves back together again. And, and that's really part of my mission in the world is to teach people how to authentically and appropriately help other people around their sexual issues. But it's a charged topic because it's so intimate and so personal. And we feel so nervous and so vulnerable around sex. Don't you agree? No, I mean, it's, it's why I brought it up. This isn't, you know, not part of our prescripted questions. And <laughs> right. uh, it, it's one of the things that I assiduously avoid wading into because I'm conscious of, I don't know what I don't know. I'm not a sex expert. I've been doing this business long enough to consider myself an expert, but, yes. um, but, yeah. but, uh, you know, I have opinions about sex. I've experience with sex, but I don't have any, certainly expertise or training or, or, or anything in that regard. I'm not that well read about it. And so I just don't touch it. And I think most of my readership is yeah. largely fine with that because I think we sure. are all, all, it is, it's as common as anything in the world. It's how we all got here. And yet it remains a taboo subject. So it's That's the right. thing, it's like the, always the elephant in the room is sex. And it's ubiquitous. It's yes. everywhere in everything with everyone. Yes. Not only are we born human, we come from sex. <laughs> because if, as you say, if there weren't a procreative act, we wouldn't be talking right now. And it's something that is intrinsic and natural to being human. And there's such interesting literature and research that shows that we're actually sexual from conception in the uterus. There actually is documentation that fetuses have the capacity for arousal, which is a really far out thought. And we're sexual from that era, from the beginning of our lives until the end of our lives. And I, and I think that it's such a charged topic because we're supposed to know how to do it or be it. And we're not taught. I always am stunned when I have a client sitting in front of me and I realize like the client today who is in a marriage with a very um, traditional, if not orthodox background, married someone that was her first love experience and her first sexual experience. And they don't know what they're doing. They're like li little children who are fumbling and groping to figure out this thing called sex. 
And we're not taught how to have sex, how to be sexual, how to express our sexual energies in authentic and powerful and healthy ways. And so lots of times I think we go underground and it gets twisted and, and that makes it more confusing than ever. And so, you know, sex is very complex and layered. It's not simple and easy and we're taught somehow by not being taught that it should come naturally. We should be great lovers. And that's not what's going on. And so many people suffer from one of the biggest culprits, which is what I call toxic shame. Especially shame about our bodies, shame about how we should look, shame about our genitals in particular, a topic that I'll bet you don't have on the show very often <laughs> because we really have such ambivalence about our sexual anatomy and physiology because we're not taught about it. And, and it's, it, can, it can really be overwhelming and overpowering. What, what is your focus? Is it helping individuals overcome their uh, sexual shame dysfunction, or is it teaching other people to do what you do? I mean, you've got this sort of bifurcated business, which is training other people to be sex, sex educators and helping individuals. Where, where is more of your time and energy devoted these days? Well, thanks for asking that question, because in fact, I am a trifurcate. <laughs> Of course, why limit you? You're, course. In, you're, you're in Los Angeles. Exactly, Southern California. So. I think the answer to the question is that most of my attention today, because I've been doing this for many decades, is to focus on training professionals. And what we know is if we look at the background of most psychotherapists, social workers, counselors, they don't have a lot of training in human sexuality. The, the maximum required in California to become licensed as a marriage and family therapist, for example, is 10 hours. That's it in their whole training. And so here they are, they're doing the couple's work. They have a you know, disgruntled couple sitting in front of them in their therapy office. They're talking about communication and all their issues. And then when it comes to SEX, the therapist goes, oh, I don't talk about that. Let me send you to the sex specialist. And so I get this donut hole effect, right? Like people come to me who are sent by their therapist for the one-on-one -on -one work that I do, which is very, very small as a part of my practice and as a part of my work in the world, because I really have dedicated myself to training other professionals, even doctors. They get three to 10 hours max of human sexuality education in all of their med school training, even gynecologists and urologists. Aren't you scared hearing that? Um, <laughs> uh, I, it's hitting me in such a way because my wife just went to the gynecologist and my daughter who's six uh had a uti and got went to the doctor just last oh. night um uh and again uh, f female issues um men don't claim to understand largely don't want to understand just want to assume everything is okay and not have to really uh w wade in there now again talking about about the functionality of lady parts is very different than talking about sex for pleasure. Correct. Um, so we should probably separate them. But but yes, everything you're saying is striking a chord about the uh, ignorance of our medical professionals in this universal important area. But also not just the ignorance, and I, I'm so sorry because as a six-year-old girl, there's so much mystery about that part of your body. Sure. I'm sure there's you know so many conversation opportunities have to arise to talk about that part of your body that's down there covered by the bathing suit the part that is like you know oh we don't show that in public of course appropriately right well, they're, they're so well they're so innocent uh mm -hmm. and you talk about kids being sexual my and i don't want to embarrass my daughter when she grows up and sees this but my my, my daughter has been yeah. we're aware we've been aware of her sexuality since she's two Beautiful. um uh uh, open, openly, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we call it private time. And, exactly. And, and so when, when she feels that urge and she'll think about a Disney prince or something like that, and I'm not kidding at all. It sounds kind of like it, it's, she's, she's sort of way ahead of the curve on that yeah, one. Yeah. And we don't shame her from it. We just have to teach her not to do, to do it out in public. Well, that's what parent, good parent sex education would dictate 
that there are these what we call teachable moments and there's guiding in a non freak out way yeah. guiding your kid or your kids to what's appropriate and what's appropriate is your juiciness the pleasure the good feelings of your body are lifelong and I love what you're saying because this is what creates a healthy sexual human and the way you handle it is so perfect it's not shaming it's not making it wrong or bad but saying it's natural but honey this is something we do in your own room with the door closed I know, but when she says uh, she says my vagina hurts I'm like mom, mom <laughs> could you? oh it's your turn <laughs> I was like yeah though I uh, maybe I should educate oh. myself more, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it to the person who possesses the same parts to to navigate this one. I'll I'll talk to my son when it's necessary. That sounds great. Anyway, well, we could, we could I, talk forever about sex education because the foundation of all of my work began actually as a sexuality educator, and I, yeah. I began working in the Planned Parenthood clinical setting. But also, believe it or not, I, I began as an outreach worker for a local Planned Parenthood in New England actually no, knocking on doors of poor people, houses, trailer parks, where it looked like socioeconomic issues were definitely going on sure. and teaching them about birth control. It was such a beautiful start. I'm, to my I'm, I've got my monthly donation going in. I'm, yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing I'm the, 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 do the, the, hand, the hands off version, but, but it's something. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Well, you know, you asked me about where I spend my time, and a lot of my time is spent in Sexology University, which is a new project where we are training those psychotherapists and those physicians and nurses and people who already have a clinical skill set, but they're not comfortable, knowledgeable, or skilled in talking about sex with their patients or their clients. So, what would, would, would uh, so the people who are most likely to become a sex coach through sexology, Hugh, I'm sorry if I botched it. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the people who are most likely to do that are already in the medical field or is it just someone who's listening today who's like, well, that sounds cool. Good I mean, question. Good question. Actually, there are two online training institutions that I've created. This is my work in the world and my mission. Before I leave this planet, I wanna train as many human beings as possible to be competent and caring and containers, I call it, for helping people who are stuck with their sexual issues. Yeah. And sexcoachu.com is uh, actually the online university where we train sex coaches. And a lot of them come from all kinds of backgrounds, tantric education backgrounds, sex education bloggers. We do have physicians, nurses, psychotherapists, but really this is for people who want to use a coaching style in how they carry that conversation and work with the client over time. Okay. Sexology University is for people who already have that skill set. They already kind of know how they work with a patient or a client, but they don't, they, they don't have any comfort or any ability to have a conversation about sex, including gynecologists. I'm always shocked when I leave my live events and a GYN will show up and he or she, usually a she, will say, you know, I never talk to my patients about how's your sex life going? And I mean, that's tragic, right? Here's the perfect person who should be able to engage in that conversation. And instead, they end up looking for an expert like myself and the people that I'm training who are really, we're so comfortable. I mean, really, you could ask me anything about the wide spectrum of human sexuality. And for those of you who are listening, believe me, people do. <laughs> no, I, I feel like, I, I almost feel like Two, two responsibilities, right? There's okay. the responsibility, no, there's responsibility I have to you, which is to give you, to introduce you to a new, new audience and give you a, a platform to talk about sex coach you. Um, and I know that there's a whole bunch of people listening who are like, can we just talk about sex? Can we answer some of the, the sex questions I have? Um, and I kind of want to put it to you for, you know, we've, we, we still have a good half hour left. What's the best way that we can use our time to make sure that you get to educate the educators and that Very people good. who are here listening uh, could get some tangible takeaways for their love life. What, you know, what, what should we do in, in coming sections? Because I mean, you, I mean, I have questions here about you know uh, couples. Um, you know, what are some insights about couples' lives? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like I'm being pulled in two opposite directions right now. I get it. 
So maybe we could split it in two. Okay. Because, you know, people who feel a calling to help other people around their sexual roadblocks or issues or relationship roadblocks and issues are people who are going to want to know about trainings that are available. And certainly anybody who's watching or listening can dance over to sexologyu.com or sexcoachu.com where we really do a good job. Yeah, there, and there, 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 there are going to be links for, for people Fantastic. directly beneath uh, the, the video and the blog. So Excellent. But, you know, what is it that evokes our passion or what are the problems that people face and how do we help them overcome those problems? And I'm perfectly happy to talk about that because, you know, this is what really gets us up in the morning is how can I help somebody who's sitting in front of me either by Skype or virtually on the phone even. I've actually saved marriages just by being on the phone with someone eight weeks in a row. What are some of the greatest issues that, that people are facing now regarding sexuality that perhaps they didn't 20, 30 years ago? Well, when I think about the change that has happened, um, because I'm a trend spotter in human sexuality, and I write about it and blog about it and use that in my training of people, some of the changes that have taken place have to do with the political correctness in our universe. So things like um, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And as clinicians or educators, even as consumers, we're mindful that people actually wear on their badges when they go to a meeting their, their preferred pronoun, for example. You know, do I want you to address me as him, her, she, they, whatever. That's a, that's a hard world to navigate in many ways, but it also speaks to this evolution of what we see as gender fluidity and of the emphasis on really being empowered as a person to claim who are you? Who are you in this world as a sexual being and what's your gender identity? I think, right? I think, we're, I think we're also seeing, and you could speak more to it, I've done a little bit of reading, but the, 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 if we're talking about two different scales, right? There's the, there's the Kinsey sexuality scale, right? And then there's a separate gender scale and gender is not necessarily tied to sexuality. Right? Absolutely they're, they're, correct. They're sort of se separate scales of fluidity where one can fall yes. either male or female and everything in between. Which and everything it's, in between. It's hard to fall yeah. for, for tr people who, who only see the binary to see it as anything mm -hmm. but man and woman. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's the same thing with sexualities. Um, uh, I, nobody knows this, but this is as good a time as any to talk about it. Uh, my, <clears throat> my mom fell in love with a woman uh, uh, this year. Last year, oh. they've been together for two years. They're living together. Oh. My mom is seventy years old. She was straight her entire life, and she's never it. been happier. And again, I, I I just think that that's kind of kind of neat and kind of interesting, and mm. um, how how love can come in so many forms. Um, and her partner is wonderful, and she's a part of the family. And that's and, and I've never had any personal experience with with huh. I guess sexual fluidity. So that was, that was just, yeah. that's my little contribution to this conversation. I love that. And, you know, we're living in a time where GLBTIAQ, there are many, many letters that yeah. go to the other side of that, um, is accepted and is permissible. And we look at the news at night and we see legislation regarding whether trans persons can use a public bathroom. I mean, we're living in a different era than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. But I also think that there are a couple of trends that I see and it affects how people open up and it affects how people explore and experiment and find out what do I really like? What really turns me on? And if I find that, you know, blueberries turn me on in sex, I'm making this up. Sure. And I like it in a certain way when the blueberries do something la la la, then if I'm in a relationship, how do I navigate that with a partner? How do I introduce blueberries into sex if my partner doesn't like blueberries? It, it, is there a really good answer to this? Because what, what I've discovered is, uh, I'm, so, I'm certainly left short on words. What I've observed is, in, just in a previous podcast that I did, um, the more, um, fine-tuned exclusive unique your tastes right if you're the guy who only gets off because you like being tickled well mm -hmm. there's only a smaller subset of women who think tickling is as sexy as you do exactly right? 
And so it's, you're not wrong for feeling whatever your sexual, I don't, I don't mean to talk you know, negative about it, but whatever your sexual fetish is, you're not wrong for having it. But, but if you insist that that is gonna be the focal point of your life, I need to have that, that, that part of me fed then you're going to find that there's a lot of good people who are just not going to qualify. And as a dating and relationship coach, I have a hard time dealing with people who are the outliers, right? With that, again, there's no judgment or shame. It's just, absolutely. if you like something that only 0.001% of the population likes, that's, that, that's a tricky thing to navigate. So how do people introduce, is there, is there just sort of like a canned speech for how to get someone to, to, to be experimental, to be the Dan Savage good giving game? Well, I think you're talking about two different things. So okay. I'm really glad you brought this up because one is selection error takes place for many people who have a blueberry fetish, for example, or a clown fetish or a balloon fetish, which are real fetishes mm. and are only turned on by when balloons are used and rubbed on their body or have to have their partner dress up like a clown. Ah! But Fetishes are not something we eradicate. We don't eliminate them. Sure. We learn to embrace them. We learn how to manage a fetish. What I always coach my clients who are single to consider is where is it that you're looking for prospective lovers or partners? Because it doesn't have to be a lifelong partner. Not everybody is looking for that. It may be a lover. It may be somebody who you want as a play partner, which is very vogue today. Friends with benefits, vogue today. So I say to a lot of my clients, if you're in a relationship and you want to introduce something that's a fetish or a longing or a fantasy, one of the most common, of course, in heterosexual relationships being the introduction of a third person, usually another woman, then you have to really open up the conversation. The deficit that I see in couples' lives is less between the legs and more between the ears. Yeah. Not being able to talk about it is far more common than being able to do it, meaning have sex, whatever we define that as. I'm gonna keep right. going with this um, because what happens if, uh, again, because you could flip the genders, it doesn't really matter, but one partner introduces yeah. an idea, I wanna do X, and the other partner's not open to it, right? Just, just, Shuts, shuts it down. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't do that. I have no interest in doing that. Right. Um, which is his or her right too. Absolutely. Um, you, know, to, you know, to say, hey, we love each other. We spent all these years together. I want to mix it up. And the other person's like, yeah, that just doesn't feel good to me. Now we're at an impasse. How, how do people navigate that impasse? Do, do you think it's more common for, for people to try to look outside the relationship for that? Or does one person remain dissatisfied if they change the terms of the agreement. We, well, we thought sex was this, but now you're introducing this. I, I, I feel like that's, that is sort of the question for how people navigate long-term sexuality when their needs and desires are changing or they're becoming more open about expressing them and only one, par one partner is on the train. Well, you're really in the heart now of the edge of conflict and it's not always an impasse. Sometimes it's a door opening. And many times I find that couples, and we're talking about couples primarily right now, really need somebody to advocate for the conversation to go in the right directions. That's why I do the work that I do, for example, and train other people to become sexologists. What happens is, first as a clinician, I would ask that couple, how serious is this? How, much, how intrinsic is this to who you are as a sexual person? Do you need that? Do you need to have your partner dress up in a clown outfit or spank you? Because for arousal purposes, there are people, and we see more and more today, given the Fifty Shades of Grey revolution and the impact it's had, who are playing in the world of B&D, DNS, and S&M, or BDSM, the kinky people. The people who have permission and have a whole community through FetLife.com, for example, worldwide, where they can find people like themselves, who are interested in this enormously infinite and creative spectrum of how do you turn it up with erotic power exchange, with sensory play, with role play. And so if a client of mine is a couple and one has 
a more extreme desire than the other and the other can't go there, then it's not necessarily an impasse, but it's an opportunity for a different kind of conversation. For one thing, a relationship is governed by a contract, whether it's spoken or written. And a lot of the work that I do is I, I help my couples look at their relationship as a corporation and have them renegotiate the contract terms. I also have them work once a week at having a business meeting, a check-in. How are we doing? Where are we in our contract? Maybe I want to look at term number three and I want to renegotiate that. Maybe they need to just tap dance or tiptoe into the shallow end of the pool and not dive in the deep end of the pool mm -hmm. by exploring, is this even a realm that both of us could enjoy? Because lots of times they're stuck in their projected thought about what that's really going to do to the relationship sure. or mean for each of them in the relationship. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Uh, and, and again, I'd like to think I'm a, a, a nuanced person who could see, you know, multiple sides of things. That's how I landed in this job at the same time. I also know you're dealing with, with human beings who are emotional. And so the, the guy, the guy says, and this isn't me, by the way, I, I actually don't have an interest in it. The guy says, yeah. Hey, I want to try anal. And she's like, the hell you are. And that's the end of the conversation, <laughs> right? Like that is, exactly. that is it. There's no dipping your toe into that water. It's a, it's a cold no. And then he says, honey, I think we need to see a sexologist. We got to call Dr. Patty. I, I heard about her. So you're going to, you're going to spend our money to have this woman convince me to have you put something up my ass. Like, no, and no. So, yeah. I mean, again, I could, I could see that conversation. Um, and, yeah. and again, you're, you're essentially the, uh, the, the, the moderator, right? I understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. Is there space in between both of your needs where you could get the met, but, what happens when, again, we could go back into government where one person is the party of no. <laughs> oh, please don't get started on that. <laughs> but if you have someone who's like, we're, we're the party of no, the answer is no. Yeah. Compromise is really not on the table here. And you have one party who's sexually un unfulfilled in their boyfriend, girlfriend, marriage, whatever. Exactly. Um, what is that person to do you don't want to break up with someone because of, of sex, not just because like, hey, sex is perfectly fine. I just, I'm just, you know, I want more. Yeah. You don't want to be the person who, who throws out a relationship at the same time. It's an immovable object. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not in that place, but I'm sort of theorizing for any person who's ever had sex become an issue in their relationship. Exactly. Where there isn't really communication. There's just, it is. It's virtually political. Like we look at the same thing differently and there's no space between it. What, what could you do if you have two people who refuse to compromise? Well, you've asked a really deep question because there are lots of ways of answering it. For one thing, most people lack good education about how sex works. So with this particular kind of a case, the first step would be to send them to a website and to purchase a DVD or stream my, my, my program on anal pleasure for lovers. Because teaching people what anal sex is, how it works, I would also want to know why is it a no? Why is it a hard stop no? Is this something that happened in the past for her, let's say, and it created pain? It doesn't, it doesn't look fun. It looks like it's going to hurt. And that's things, where things go out there. They don't go in there. And that's where education comes in. So it depends how, and this is going to sound really weird, but it depends how pliable her mind is uh, because the rectum is actually extremely pliable when it comes to inserting objects. So when you have a situation like this, and there is no give, there is no interest in education, there is no give. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. It depends how important that is to the individuals in the relationship. Is it a number four on a scale of 10? Like, well, I could live with it or live without it. Is it a nine and a half? I really need anal. This is absolutely my only pathway to my erection. And if that's what's going on, then you have what would look like an impasse. And then you have to look, help that couple 
I mean, again, I'm always going to answer this from the perspective of I'm a clinician yeah, no, no. going for the betterment of that relationship and the fulfillment of the individuals in that relationship. And I coach my couples to consider what are the deal makers and what are the deal breakers. And there are people who really, you know, the saddest couple that I would ever work with is a couple who've been together for the long haul, who have children, who've invested in the corporation, they have housing, they have financial gain together. And they but won't find a compromise point on it. They this. can't find a compromise. Yeah. I'm not even sure it's won't. I'm, a, I, I'm sure. saying it's a can't. Yeah. And, and there they are, and they're literally stuck in sexual incompatibility. And always the conversation goes back to, if only we had met you 20 years ago. Yeah before we signed on the dotted line. And, and it's tragic for me. It's tragic when couples come to me and they say, we want you to get the spark going. And I say, well, when was the spark alive? And they say, actually, we really never were really high spark people. We never really were too great with sex, never really too attracted to each other, but we want you to help us just go crazy aren't for you, each other. Aren't you, a I, aren't you a magician too? That's when I get that's out the, my magic wand. Good, good, good. <laughs> And I say, I can get you one of these, but I can't change your erotic connection. I can only give you ideas for how to enhance that. And here are five suggestions, for example. You, I'm so delighted to hear the way you approach this. And again, I, I find it very validating because you're a doctor and I'm just a dude with an opinion. Um, but, but the way you approach this is, is very much the way I think dating and relationships are yeah. a, a, approached. It's that we're not we're not starting from a place of right and wrong you want this you want this what's the middle ground where both people could feel satisfied is this the hill you want to die on are you going to make this into a, a deal breaker the more deal breakers you have the fewer deals you'll have exactly. um but you could literally substitute sex for anything it could be height weight income education money religion like how big a deal are you going to make of this and how much room do you have yeah. to give and the more flexible you are the more options for dating and relationships you have, the more inflexible you are, yeah, the fewer options you have. There's also another answer to the question, which I didn't say, which is that anything you long for that you can't act on is terrific for fodder for fantasy. So having that relationship with that longing, that fetish, if it's not something that you must have in real time in real life, then you can use that mentally to turn yourself on. And you know, there's a, there's a conundrum, which is that you have to turn me on is how often couples look at each other. Mm -hmm. And actually you're responsible for turning yourself on. God bless you for saying that one. Um, I it just, just opened up a whole other flood of thoughts. Um, I'll only share one with you because we're going to go to another break. Um, the idea, and again, this is something that I see a lot. Maybe you could speak to it from a more clinical perspective. I speak to it from a guy perspective, but from a more <laughs> clinical perspective, one of the things that I've seen that uh, a lot of the women who turn to me have a hard time with is, again, I call myself a reality-based dating coach. Like, I'm not here to say things that are popular. I'm just, my observations about what is, is pretty true. You just talked about the idea of a fantasy life, right? Hey, mm -hmm. if you can't... If he can't get anal from his wife, the least he can do is keep it up here um, and, and use, it, use it to get off uh, during the act or uh, occasional masturbation or something like that. And it, it remains compartmentalized, but, but, but healthy. Um, I've talked to a lot of women who are very threatened by the idea that a man can find other women attractive, have a fantasy life, masturbate, utilize porn in small doses, not porn addict. And that somehow those things are all a threat. If, it, if it's not about me, he's cheating on me. Could you, could you address that? Because I think my feelings are pretty obvious that men are always gonna find other people attractive. He, he could love, love you more than life itself and he'll still find other things attractive. And it, it's not inherently threatening. It's how you process that and act on it. But that's, that's an opinion that's, that's certainly not a doctor speaking. So am I, am, am I misguided or am I getting close? My response to you is amen. Okay. Cause I, <laughs> I again, I, but, I say things and people yell at me and I, I'm like, <laughs> I, I can't be the only person who feels this way. 
but I don't think I could be in a relationship with someone who made me pretend that I thought she was the only attractive per person on the planet. Well, we're erotic creatures and we get turned on easily and by many, many stimuli, males and females. This isn't just relegated to males sure. or men, human men. And so part of the, the, the need, and it's not out there in the culture very easily or readily, is to understand that people like me and sexologists, one of our biggest roles and contributions is giving permission to people and helping to reframe the static, the noise, the chatter in your head that's, that's really hurting yourself. The, so me the meaning and the weight that we give that as opposed to Absolute, what it actually is. It's not, it's not true, it's not real. It's your story. A lot of the work that many of us do is to help our clients restate, rewrite their sexual story. It's what are you telling yourself? Stop it. <laughs> Sometimes I sit in the room with somebody and go, stop it. <laughs> let's just put the pause button. Now, let's also, also I do a lot of that. That's very <laughs> validating to know that real doctors do that too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's our heritage, I think. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> there's something about understanding that your response is you. It's not because of it. Yeah. And it's not always about you. <laughs> and that's really hard for a lot of people to accept. Yeah, we're inclined, It's not always about me. We're, well, we're inclined to, you know, again, we're the center of our own universe. We're inclined of to course. think that if he does X, it is, you know, it's in reaction to me. Again, I did another yeah. podcast where, you know, he had a work late and that became a referendum on how much he cared about her. Right. When he wasn't really making a choice, he didn't have a choice. He had a work late. It wasn't disrespect to her. And I, I feel like, uh, innocuous things are very easily conflated into things that are disrespectful and things that are disre disrespectful, right? Oh, well, so you're saying a man can look at another woman. Well, my husband goes to strip clubs and gets their numbers. Well, I didn't say that. That's, that's completely different. Exactly. Exactly. And those, those are being treated as if they're the same thing. There's also something in safer sex education years ago when I was working in the preventing of HIV arena, there was something I used to teach my groups. And I used to say, I'm going to give you the two dirtiest words in the English language. And people go, ooh, what are you going to say? And I say, people lie. So it relates to what you're talking about, that when Susie is sitting in front of me and telling me, oh, my husband is going to cheat on me. You know, he gets turned on by people at the office and I'm just not good enough. My breasts are too small, blah, 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 that self-talk. The truth is that's your story you're making about it. And if you go to your girlfriends and you talk about it or you go to your friends and they say, oh, no, that never happens to me. It's because they lie. People make up stuff. And that's why it's important sometimes when you're really stuck in a relationship or alone that you really spend the money and hire an expert to help you because sometimes you really need somebody who's skilled and qualified and trained to guide you on where do you go next with this dilemma that you're facing. That's the best ad I could ever have for uh, what we do. Um, absolutely, absolutely, and, and I, I, I don't take new clients unless they're referred by their psychotherapist. So I'm not feathering my own nest. I'm telling I, the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm. I, I only wish we had a two-hour podcast. We're going to take a break. We're going to be back for our last segment with Dr. Patty Britton. My name is Evan Marquette. This is the Love You Podcast. Uh, I want to continue that conversation. I want to continue on that thread because uh, what. Dr. Patty's talking about is sort of the normalization of fantasy. Rather than being embarrassed about it, uh, whether you're a man or a woman, the more we can embrace, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm thinking, uh, the, more we, the less likely we are to feel shame sharing it with our partners, the healthier we're gonna be in our sexual relationships because we can actually get our needs met when we express them. So Dr. Patty, take that ball and run with it. Well, I was just thinking about something when, when I, Many years ago, when I worked at the National Office of Planned Parenthood, I had a boss who was just an amazing guy, he did a lot of research in sex. And he did this really cool piece of research. And it was that in a sexual act, so from the beginning of sex till it was completed for two people, only 3% of the sexual act was spent in sexual intercourse or penis and vagina sex, heterosexually speaking. 
And, and he used to say, so why do we make such a big deal about it? And a lot of sex is the thinking about it. And I just want to bust a myth. I want to bust this myth that when we're being sexual with another person, we're focusing on our beloved. We're into that person. We only look at her or him. Nothing else is happening in our head or our bodies are just one and we're going for merging and union and, you know, outer space travel. Well, that's all lovely. But the fact is that we're always fantasizing because our brain is moving it's all the time. And some of that is accessing, it's kind of like when you close your eyes, you actually can go inward. Even orgasm is a very selfish, self-referring act. So when we're having an orgasm, we're not like, oh, that other person, we're like, oh, God, <laughs> we're in us. And there's this whole mystique about what is sex, that it's this other-oriented thing, and it's actually very self-oriented. And it's perfectly natural to be fantasizing about somebody or something else if it's getting your motor running. And that's the permission I want to give. And stop making it a cheat, because this is what people do and hurt themselves by telling themselves he or she is thinking about that last lover, or I'll never be as good as the one she told me about. It's like, let it go. Just enjoy the pleasure. When people have performance anxiety, which is the biggest killer of sex, it's why men can't keep an erection or get an erection, why women don't have an orgasm and many other things, they're actually living neck up. They're above their neck in their heads. Not that your mind can't help you in sex, but if you're up here in worry, you're not in your body. And that's where sex happens, neck down. So you need, to be, you need to be taught how to get sex down. That's why I started Sex Coach University, because I wanted to train other people how to be that guide to let people get out of that stuck place and get out of living neck up. So much of my work is about letting people learn how to be embodied. I can't tell you, it's like 90% of all the conversations that I have. So I went on a tangent around fantasy, but I think I made my point. I think you did as well. Um... Uh, for women who have trouble having pleasure, right? I mean, it's, I think it's another thing. It, 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 again, the, there are topics that are inherently taboo. Miscarriage is taboo. So I talk about, I talk about our experience with uh, multiple miscarriages. Um, being uh, inorgasmic is sort of taboo. Um, and I, I feel like I did some research, yeah. 10, 15% of women I uh, can't have an orgasm, not, not, not clitoral nor vaginal. Um, uh, what's the best way for those women to get embodied or get in touch with themselves or where, you know, they, they've, they've really wanted it, but they couldn't cross that threshold for, for whatever reason. No guy could get them there. Very good. So I call it going over the waterfall, for example, because okay. you're stuck on an edge. And if we go back to sexual science with Masters and Johnson, the sexual response cycle is actually a, a linear model that was created, which related to males. Now we look at a circular model related to females. And when we get in a high state of arousal, it's kind of like, nee, 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 nee. we can't go and let go. Lots of times it's a fear of letting go. I got to tell you, it's so simple. And it's also feeling like I'm taking too long. In, in, in so it's like a guilt, and so you just get back guilt. in your head about There's it? So many dynamics where I'm having a conversation with a couple, especially the female in a heterosexual couple. She'll say, oh, it takes me so long to have my orgasm. And he gets tired, especially if oral sex might be the way she becomes orgasmic. Mm -hmm. And she'll say, oh, I don't want him to get tired. And it takes me forever. And I say, how long does it take? Oh, I don't know. I don't have a clock. I say, well, that's your first assignment. I want you to get a timer. And I want you to get real about how long it's taking. And she'll come back and she'll say, oh, it took four minutes. And I say, oh, honey, <laughs> don't you know that for most women, it takes from 20 to 60 minutes to experience an orgasm. And I also take away that sense of pressure. And it's another performance anxiety issue. Yeah. It's, I should be coming. I should let go. I sometimes do this. And, and, I, and I, th I, think, I think women would, would underestimate um, yes. how how much a man would want to please like you know like that's that's sort of like his gold star is yes. uh, you know 
if, if, if you're not one of those guys who's just trying to get off as quickly as possible, but if you like, yeah. if you take pride in your love making skills, you want to make someone happy. And, oh, if I know this is going to take 20 minutes, all right, let's, let's make this happen. And right? Instead of, oh, you know, I feel so bad, pick your head up and don't worry about me. And like, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's like a sort of sexual martyrdom, right? Yeah. The, the Ian Kerner book is She Comes First. And exactly. a, lot of, a lot of guys take pride in, in being that way. Mm -hmm. But if you don't see to get your sexual needs met, there's nothing he can do. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the tricky part. It's easy to blame guys for being terrible in bed. I'm sure yeah. there's no shortage of them. Um, at the same time, it, I mean, if you, if you can't help him, right, whatever that means, get you over the waterfall, then you'll never get over the waterfall, I'm guessing. Yes. And I just want to make a sidebar that 90% yeah. of the problems with males is Are that too. they're worried, they're performing, they're not in the experience, they're performing and analyzing performance neck up. And their arousal is based on, is she having an orgasm? Am I doing a good job? It's so classical Mars Venus stuff. It really is. And I'm a big fan of John Gray. I always have been. And so there's something intrinsic about really owning your own pattern. I think women don't know their own pattern. And one of the shocking pieces of news is that if you're not masturbating, then you really don't know how your own body works. And masturbation is not a cheat. <laughs> it's actually it's the foundation for all partner sex and it's mm. its own way of expressing your sexual desire, your sexual energy, and finding out how does your body really work. So that's the pathway to orgasm for women as well. If they don't know how they work, most right. women need. It would be hard to give the guy the manual if you don't you know can't. how it works. You don't even yeah. know how the car gets started. Yeah. So you, you know, one of my mentors and, and friends is Dr. Betty Dodson, and I was trained in her method, and I used to do, I'll call it chair side coaching for pre-orgasmic women and also changing the language. So I don't use medical terminology that relates to disease. She's pre-orgasmic. She's not anorgasmic. And... And it's not premature ejaculation. It's early or rapid ejaculation. Framing language also the shame out of how we, how we talk about sex. I so like I just that. wanted to add that. I've never said this before, uh, and not, not to, uh, not to, certainly not to be disrespectful of uh, any of the other guests I've ever had, but I desperately want you to come back for another time so Aww. we can continue this conversation. I feel like we've just scratched the surface of, uh, mm. of what we can learn. And again, I, I, I'm particularly drawn to this subject because it is not an area that I'm already expert in. Like, I just feel like yeah. a, a student with a lot of questions, uh, not as, I'm, not, I'm certainly not the teacher in this situation. So thank mm. you for, for uh, educating me and educating our audience today. It's my pleasure. Um, yeah. uh, what can someone who is watching, whether they are an individual or want to be a sex coach or mm -hmm. learn more about you, we have a link to your three video series that I know is going to be uh, um, you know, beneath this podcast. Are there any other resources uh, for, for people who want to follow up with you that you would recommend? Well, the video series is about sex coaching and you know, maybe it is something that calls your name, maybe it isn't. But to learn more about me, you could also stop by my own website, which is my name, drpattybritton.com. And I have a lot of blog posts and resources and some, I have a store also for some of those streaming videos. So that might be helpful for some of you watching. But I guess I, I would also want to say in the short time we have left that what I'm seeing today as a trend, and it's, a, it's not a happy trend, is that there's way too much time being spent on electronic devices and not a lot of in-person time. Too many of us are living electronically or virtually and not flesh to flesh. And I really am an advocate for taking an e-fast. If there's one little tiny thing you do, if you're in a relationship, it's make a decision that tonight, starting tonight, two hours of your evening after dinner, there's no electronics going on and that you can be with your person who is your beloved, your partner, and spend time with that person looking in their eyes, having all your senses open and hearing them, feeling them, touching them. It doesn't have to be sexual. 
but we're starved for touch too in this era. So that's something that I really want to shout out and say, do this starting today. I, I, I will take that to heart. I will take that as a, as, as a, a personal challenge. And I don't know how I'm going to make it through tonight without watching This Is Us with my wife, but we're going to try. We're going to probably try find it. something else to do. Maybe not sex, probably a board game, I'm thinking. That's fine. No, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will take your digital challenge, and I would encourage anybody else who's in a relationship to, to unplug and take your focus off your phone or your, or your television um, mm -hmm. and focus on your partner. So that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the amazing Dr. Patty Britton. Thank you for joining me here on this Love You podcast. My name is Evan Mark Katz. Next week, I'm going to be asking the question, what's so confusing about men? Um, I'm always surprised, but I, I, I hear we're confusing, and I want to clear up any of those misconceptions, and I hope you can chime in. If you enjoy this coaching and want to be a future guest on the Love You podcast, go to www.evanmarkkatz.com forward slash podcast guest to see upcoming topics and ask your questions. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Leave me nice reviews when you can. And best of all, I give away more free dating and relationship advice than anybody on the entire internet on www.evanmarkatz.com. Give me your name and email address. I will help you get the love you, you deserve. Patty will get you help, help you get the sex you deserve. Yeah. And I will see you again next week on the Love You Podcast. Mm -hmm.